Okay. Um, if you want to turn in your Bible this morning to Genesis chapter 17, we're going to talk about the subject of laughter in the life of a Christian. See what the Bible has to say about that. Who? But we'll start out with a question: Who was the very first? When? Excuse me. When was the first uh, instance of laughter recorded in the Bible? Who was the very first to laugh? In other words, Sarah. No. No. Close. Abraham. Abraham was the very first one to laugh. Genesis chapter 17, verse 15 through 19. We'll start out there. And God said in unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, O oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear, bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. Now, of course, in our Bible study this past week, we were talking about the covenant. And there you see it. But you see the very first time that laughter is is mentioned there, it's in connection with God telling Abraham he's going to do something, and Abraham laughs about it. Now, Sunday evenings, I usually go to visit with my grandparents. And my grandfather is 97, and my grandmother is 93. And it would seem pretty ridiculous to, to say that they're going to have a child. You know, and so you can kind of understand why Abraham would laugh at a thing like that. And Abraham's even older. He's 100 years old when he had, you know, Isaac. So you can see the very first time laughter shows up there. But go to uh, chapter 18, verse 9. We'll see the next instance of laughter here. Chapter 18, verse 9. Okay, here, we aren't going to read all the verses, but uh, verse 1 down through verse 8, you have the Lord appearing, and there, there are basically three men that come to Abraham, and they're talking to him, and he you know, makes a meal for him, essentially. And he's out there speaking with these three men, and Sarah is back in the tent. And it says here in verse 9, And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself. Notice she did not laugh outwardly. She laughed within herself saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh? <laughs> he heard it. <laughs> Nobody else did, but he heard it. Saying, Shall I of a surety bear, bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Now look what Sarah says. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laughed not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. Uh, you're not going to pull one over on the Lord. <laughs> Even if you do something secretly, he knows about it. Okay, But so, the first two references to laughter, are they positive or negative? Negative. Negative. Yeah. It's two people laughing at God's promise. Now, Again, God had grace for him because it seemed like an impossible thing, but they laughed at what God said. Okay, so let's look at the next one. Genesis chapter 21. Turn there. Genesis chapter 21, verse 1 through 6. I heard a preacher say the one time that uh, prophecy in the Bible is pre-recorded history. God says He's going to do something. It's going to happen. 
Okay, now God told him that they were going to have a child. So chapter 21, verse 1. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. God's word will come through. Verse 2. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was an hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all that will hear will laugh with me. So what's the second reference to laughter? Negative or positive? Positive. Positive. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's out of joy. It's out of rejoicing. Yeah. So the first one is negative. They laughed at what God said. God fulfilled it. And then they laughed out of joy. They rejoiced about it. Okay. So there is, you know, basically, if you want to boil it right down, there are two types of laughter. Negative and positive. All right. Now, but what does the Bible say about laughter? Okay. Turn to Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22. This study is going to be about laughter and, and uh, you know, whether you, how much of it you should do in, in your life as a Christian. And, and uh, so we'll see as we go on here, we'll see about that. But Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22 says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Now, can you have a merry heart and not laugh? Sure. Absolutely. But many times laughter can come from a merry heart. Okay, it, it is important occasionally to laugh. Okay, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. But you have to be careful about that. And we're going to see as we continue here. Turn back to turn back, excuse me, to Proverbs chapter 14 verse 13. And we're going to see laughter is not always a sign of a merry heart. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 13 says even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful, and the end of that mirth is heaviness. Isn't it amazing that many of the famous comedians in Hollywood end up committing suicide? Oh, they're funny people. They make people laugh. Yeah, and they're miserable. You know, I've seen that a couple times. You know, these guys that, you know, I don't watch TV anymore, but back when I used to watch it, I remember there was a guy, a big famous comedian, and he's laughing and, you know cutting it up and everything. And, and just like that, this real sad look came over his face and he said, I just wish I could find a woman that would love me for more than my money. And he was real somber just for a minute. You could just see this intense sorrow. And then back to the funny thing again. And I thought, I bet you that guy has all kinds of drug problems and other mental problems and issues. But he's funny. You know? See? Laughter does not necessarily mean that they have a merry heart. Okay, and, and of course, uh, what's the Bible say about that? Isaiah 48, verse 22, There's no peace, there's no peace saith the Lord, under the wicked. Lost people don't really have peace. They can pretend, they can fake it. And what's the best way to fake peace? What's the best way to fake joy? Laugh. Mm -hmm. Comedy Central. <laughs> yeah. Turn to, next we're going to go to Psalm uh, 126. Psalm 126, verse 1. And we're going to see here again about righteous people laughing. Psalm 126, verse 1. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. By the way, that's the right thing to do. If the Lord's done good things, you say it in front of the heathen. God's really blessed me. You know, I'll just say this quick about my grandmother, or grandparents, both of them. When people find out how old they are, 
they said, what's your secret? How, you know, she's, I mean, she's 93 years old. She still drives a car. They live in their own home. You know, they go out shopping and whatever. And they say, what's your secret? The first words out of their mouth will be the Lord. The Lord has given us our health. They don't say, well, you know, we've eaten a lot of vegetables and we try to stay active. The Lord, you know, and that's the way it should be for a Christian. Okay. Um, Let's continue here. Verse three. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Is it hard to do tracting sometimes? Yes. Yeah. But if you're doing it to please the Lord, the Lord will bless those efforts. Okay? Maybe you won't see the the blessings in this life. Maybe, you know, the seeds that you're putting out as tracks, maybe you won't see it till the fruit of that till eternity. But the Lord will bless it. Okay? All right, now let's uh, go to Job chapter 8. We'll go there next. It's kind of interesting when you think about it, too. Because who really has more of a right to laugh than Christians? I mean, you know, we're headed for glory. We're more than conquerors. You know, I mean, (laughs) things are only going to get better for us. Even after, you know, after death, we go to be with the Lord. You know, perfect glorified bodies. You know, we should be the ones that can laugh. The lost world really doesn't have much to laugh about. Uh, But anyhow, let's continue on here. Uh, Job chapter 8, verse 20 says... Behold, God will not cast away a perfect man, neither will he help the evil doers, till he fill thy mouth with laughter and thy lips with rejoicing. They that hate thee shall be clothed with shame, and the dwelling place of the wicked shall come to naught. It's all going to work out in eternity. Down here, you might be mocked, well, not might be, you will be mocked as a Christian. The wicked are going to hate your guts, you know. And they're increasing in number. But it's going to work out. And even the most rich, powerful man out there, someday is going to be clothed with shame. And they're going to come to naught. The rich, most, the people, you know, they're going to be in hell for all of eternity. They'll come to nothing. Okay? You're not going to worry about them in eternity. So keep your mind on eternal things. All right, next we're going to go to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes... Chapter 3, right after the book of Proverbs, that's where this book is. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, we're going to read. It says, To every thing there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. Now look at verse 4. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. When is there a time to weep and to mourn? Well, we're going to get into that as we continue on here. Luke chapter 6. A bunch of scriptures we're going to be going through today, so... And do a lot of turning, a lot of reading. Luke chapter 6, verse 20. This is one of the most important things that people need to understand. Verse 20 through 26. These are very, very important scriptures, especially for modern professing Christians, because it gives you the right, uh, right relationship that a Christian should have to the world is what is given here. Let's look at these. Uh, Verse 20, And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Now we've covered this in other studies, but the kingdom of God is is spiritual. Okay? You want to be in fellowship with the Lord. When you're poor, you're going to be praying a lot more. You're going to be relying on the Lord a lot more. If you're rich and you have plenty of things, well... You don't really need to pray much. And they have done actually studies as to who reads the Bible the most. 
and it's always the people with the lowest income. Interesting. And, and Jesus always went to the poor. You know, gospel was preached unto the poor. Interesting. But anyhow, verse 21. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Oh, you're one of those King James Bible believers, you know, a Ruckmanite. <laughs> you know, if you stand for the King James Bible, you are going to get to experience verse 22 firsthand. You will. I, I mean, I'm, I'm meeting people on the Internet all over the world, and it's all the same thing. Well, you know, I don't get along good with my parents. They're going to a modern church and they, you know, they kind of think I'm nuts. And and uh, my pastor just told me I can't talk about this. And I, this person here and I got kicked out of this church. And it's right there. Okay, verse 23. Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. It's a good thing. But woe unto you that are rich. For ye have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. You know, there's a lot of people right now that are laughing at the King James Bible. A lot of people mock this book. Guess where they're going to be in the Great Tribulation? They're not going to laugh anymore. They might blaspheme God. You know, it says that there's a lot of that going on. But they're going to learn how hard life is going to be in that time period. They're going to mourn and weep. You know, when you, when all the waters turn into blood and there's all kinds of horrible things happening, you're not going to be laughing. The big funny jokes are going to be over. Verse 26, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Look out for that. If you see a preacher who's being interviewed all over TV and people think very highly of him, don't follow that guy. He's no good. Ephesians chapter 5. Now we're going to hit one that's pointed directly at Christians. You can't duck this one. And this one is rough. This one's very rough. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 through 7. It says here, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Excuse me. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it be not once named among you, as becometh saints. Let me just stop there before I go on. I've talked to a lot of saved people, and they say, well... You know, I'm no saint. Uh, you better be. You better realize that you should live above the standards of the world. There better be some conviction there. Be careful of that. But look at verse 4. Here's where it gets rough. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Hmm. Foolish talking, jesting. You know, there's a lot of that. You know, one of the reactions to fear that people have is they start talking foolishly. Start trying to crack jokes and things. Yeah. I'll tell you a real quick little story here. A buddy of mine and I were at a, a gun shop here just this past week and went in there and the one young man that was working at the gun shop... He started telling this just a filthy, dirty story. I won't even repeat it. I mean, just filthy. You know, it's real good for your customers, you know. That's a real good thing to do as, a, as somebody that works at a store, but whatever. And there was an older man there, and he said, he said, where'd you hear a story like that? And the kid said, oh, it was, it was on this uh, TV show. You know, he couldn't even come up with a real story. His experiences, his funny stories come from something made up on television, you know? And here our country is on the verge of economic collapse. We're looking at maybe possible World War III starting, you know, go to war with Iran and, and all this stuff. 
all the problems that are going on in the country, and this this kid, all he can think about is some filthy story that he saw that's made up on television. You know? And ha, 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 boy, it's funny. Yeah, yeah. It's ridiculous. And how many people in America are like that right now? They see the problems, they see, you know, and just take salvation. Even without all the secular problems in the world. What about salvation? And all they want to do is laugh and joke. And Christians, a lot of times, do the same thing. The church is in real bad shape right now. Let's joke about it. Let's laugh about it. We're going to see some of that here in just a little bit. But you've got to be careful of that as a Christian. You see, when you laugh, what is that doing good for? Your flesh. Okay? Now, is that bad? No. You have to sleep. You have to eat. And, you know, occasionally you should laugh. Okay, it's good for you. A merry heart doeth good as a medicine. Okay, but should you laugh too much? Should you eat too much? Should you sleep too much? No. The idea for a Christian there is moderation. You shouldn't say, I will not laugh. I will never laugh at anything. I won't even smile. No, you need to laugh once in a while. You know, if you don't, you'll go crazy. <laughs> you know, you need to have somewhat of a sense of humor. You know, I believe the Lord has a sense of humor. You can kind of see it throughout the Bible. But don't laugh too much. Don't act like a fool to the point where you're just talking foolishly and jesting all the time. you got to watch that. And I say one other thing here before we continue on. It's interesting because I've noticed that even among Christians, the more foolish talking goes on, the more you let this mouth... You know, the Bible talks about your tongue being a world of iniquity. The more you let that tongue speak, the filthier it'll get. And I've seen that among Christians. They'll start laughing and, you know, cutting it up, and it'll start getting filthy. It's interesting. Be careful about that. But let's continue on here. Verse 5. For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. You're to suffer with Jesus Christ. If you suffer, you will reign with him. Verse 6, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. They say, well, then it's not written to Christians. Huh? Look at verse 7. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Don't act like the lost world. That's sin. Be very, very careful about that. Now there's a similar passage here we'll go to quick. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. It says here, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which, thing, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. You don't want to make God mad. <laughs> okay? Be careful about those things. Real quick here, I just want to show you some articles from our local newspaper here. Here you have, uh, Let its Grace Brethren Church will present a night of comedy at its crosswalk show. <laughs> Bringing in Christian comedians. Nice. You know, church is falling apart, apostasy just running rampant. Let's bring in the comedians. The jesting fools. And here you go. Stand up for Jesus. Number of Christian comedians grows. You got the guy there. And I got to read just part of this. It says here, If God has a sense of humor, he's got a lot more to laugh at now. That's how it starts at. Out. Hmm. Why don't you read the book of Revelation sometime, see how much laughing God is doing. The wrath of God is about to be poured out on this planet, and it's going to be worse than any time in history. Oh, but God's got more to laugh at now. Sure. You see, that's why you know some people. You know, oh, you shouldn't be so so radically against this modern church. I'll be radically against it because it is a it is an abomination. It's just disgusting. It makes me sick. And sometimes it gets so ridiculous, I do laugh at it. But it's out of, it's out of sarcasm. I don't, you know, it's not it's not a funny thing. 
But it says here, mixing punch lines and religion is easier these days, as churches are more accepting of humor as a way to provide hope and express God. And you know, this isn't some Christian publication. This is the newspaper. The lost world sees this. They see that. They no longer look at Christianity as something that they can respect and as Christians as, as having control of their lives. No, Christians are just like the lost world now, professing Christians. I think a lot of these people are lost. But it says here, uh, and you can see this on the picture. You, know, you can look at it later. But it says, others make a living doing stand-up gigs for higher paying groups such as the Promise Keepers. <laughs> he's got a he's got a promise keepers t shirt on. Isn't that nice? Promise keepers, the ecumenical group that it is, bringing Catholics and Protestants together. A bunch of men sitting around talking about feelings. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And this guy here, they 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 asked him, they interviewed him, and, and he says here, "I'm not a preacher. I'm not an evangelist. I'm not a prophet or anything. I'm just a comic." Chapter and verse. Says Brad Stein, a stand-up comedian recently profiled in the New Yorker magazine. Hmm. Woe to you when all men shall speak well of you. Huh. Being interviewed in the New Yorker magazine in a positive light. The same types of magazines and national mainstream media that cut on Christian street preachers. Oh, but this guy's okay. He's a good guy. We like him. It says here, his frenetic routine, he explains, is more along the lines of social commentary. Quote, it's more of a philosophical exploration than it is a dogmatic sort of trying to convert people thing. <laughs> nice. Real nice. We're going to be reading some verses. We're going to be reading some verses about that kind of nonsense here as we continue. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Turn back there. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes chapter 7. We're going to see about this guy. What the Lord thinks. Okay, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 3. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools, for as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This also is vanity. See, the King James Bible has everybody's number. Jesus said, the word that I've spoken to you, the same will judge you in the last day. Right there. Well, what does the Bible really say about Christian comedy? Right there. And you're going to see more of it in the New Testament, by the way, too. You can't duck it. Okay. All right. Turn back to the New Testament again. James chapter 4. Now, James, there are a lot of things that you can apply in that book for instruction and in righteousness in the lives of Christians today. But the full fulfillment of the book of James, read verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, it's to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Okay? The full fulfillment of the book of James will be in the time of Jacob's trouble, the coming great tribulation. But let's look at uh, James chapter 4, verse 7. It says here, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Now look at verse 9. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. What is... I've gone over this in other studies, but I'll just repeat it again. What is the purpose of this time of Jacob's trouble? You know, it's not some kind of a, a storm forecast that's coming and, you know, here it comes. No, it's God has it as a purpose to correct the nation of Israel and to bring them back in line and restore them. That's the purpose of it. And why are they going, going to be corrected? Because of their sin. 
and the rest of the world too. You think it's going to be bad for Jerusalem. It's going to be worse for the rest of the world. It's going to be bad. Now what should you be doing in that time period? Laughing, telling jokes, or mourning and weeping and getting right with the Lord, humbling yourself. That's what you should be doing. And we're getting very close to that. The longer that we are here on this earth, you know, waiting the rapture, waiting the catching away of the body of Christ, the longer we are here, we're going to see it get more and more and more evil and more and more bad where we should be mourning and weeping. It should upset you, the condition of this nation. You know, I pray a lot of times, God, God please forgive us. Have mercy on us. If God just says, I mean, if Christians just, well, whatever, you know, to me it's not a big issue. You don't want God's judgment on this nation. You don't want to go through God's judgment. Okay? Read back through Jeremiah, Isaiah, you know. It can be rough in God's judgment. We want to put that off. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll get back into that then. Okay, but how should a Christian live right now? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Like I said, James is primarily doctrinally pointed at Jews in the tribulation. But what about here in the church age where we are right now? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. We're going to see some interesting things here. Okay, it says here, verse 1, But of the times and the seasons... Let me stop for just a second. Chapter 4, verses 16 through 18 is one of the passages that describes the rapture. Okay? But then he goes on to, to explain you know, the, the times and the seasons here. He says, But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. You know, more and more there are people calling for peace and safety, and they think things are getting better. <laughs> they're not getting better. They're getting worse. And those people, the lost world, they are not going to be escaping the time of Jacob's trouble, the great tribulation that's coming. Verse 4, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Sober? Hmm. We're going to see that as we continue here. Now look at the, we're going to see the contrast here. Christians are to be sober, but look what the lost are compared to. Verse 7, For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Now, how much comfort can you give to somebody if you act like you're drunk? You can't. You need to be sober. You know, one of the, the main reasons which I have always believed in, which I never why I never drank alcohol is because I want to be sober. I want to be in control of myself. And even certain, you know, pills and things like that, like cold medication, I have to be just about dead before I'll take any kind of cold medication because it makes you, it makes you down and kind of depressed and kind of tired. I like to be in control of my body. Okay, I don't like anything at all that makes me groggy or makes me act weird or something like that. I'm not into that. And the lost world, they like the thing of getting drunk and you know laughing and things like that and foolish talking and jesting. Why? To forget their problems. That's why they drink. That's why they get drunk. Okay? And there's a sense there in which as a Christian, you need to be sober, not somber, not not just a cold ice cube. 
But you need to be sober. You need to be in control of yourself. You know, not drunken. You got to watch out for that. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of verses here. We aren't going to turn to them. Um, but 1 Timothy 3 2 uh, says, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. 1 Timothy 3.11, Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. So you have the bishop and the and his wife are to be sober. They're not to act like they're drunk. Uh, Titus 1.8, a uh, lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. So you see a bishop there, the overseer, there's really a lot of admonitions there where they're supposed to be sober. Okay, uh, Titus 2.2, 2, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. Okay, uh, verse 4, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Uh, verse 6, young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. It's there. You can't escape that. You are to be sober. Uh, 1 Peter 1.13, wherefore gird up the, line, the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, chapter 4, verse 7 in 1 Peter, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. I wanted to go to this one here. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter 5 verses 6 through 9. Okay, it says, Humble your, yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Very similar to what we read in James, the book of James. Verse 7, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant. Why? Well, it explains it. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. There are other Christians going through what you go through. Other Bible believers are being persecuted, afflicted. Okay? But be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, is out there. And he wants to take you down. He wants to ruin you. That's something you need to keep in mind. And what's the best way, if you were going into combat, would you want to go into combat sober or drunk? Sober. <laughs> you want to be sober. Okay? You are in a war here on this earth. You need to be sober. You don't want to be drunken. Okay, that's not what you want. Okay. Now, the last part of this message. There's a saying, he who laughs last, laughs, laughs best. Who gets the final laugh? What is the reference in Scripture to who laughs last? Psalm 2. <laughs> <laughs> Psalm 2. Psalm 2, verses 1 through 12. It says here, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. Illuminati, CFR, Bilderberger, all this stuff people are so worried about today. Against the Lord and against His anointed, saying... Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. He laughing at them. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Well, I believe in post-millennial doctrine. How could you believe in post-millennial or amillennial teaching? It's very clear Jesus has given the heathen for his inheritance 
and the land for his possession. Jesus Christ will rule and reign on this earth for the thousand years. Premillennial teaching is the only thing that you can believe in if you're a Bible believer. Okay? Uh, verse 9. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Turn next to Psalm 37. We're going to hit a couple of things here yet. Psalm 37. Okay. Verse 1, Fret not thyself because of evil doers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass, and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord, and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the, de the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while and the wicked shall not be, Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. How much is going to be left over after the tribulation? <laughs> Very little. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Has that happened yet? No. Oh, I believe Matthew chapter 5 is for today. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you don't. The meek are not going to inherit the earth right now. Okay? You inherit the earth by war, by fighting. But this will be true in the millennial kingdom. Okay, verse 12. The, the wicked plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. Okay, now we're not going to read the rest of the chapter, or the, excuse me, the psalm there, but read that sometime and you will see there are just so many things that you can apply to life today. I'm just going to hit a couple here quick. Look at verse 21. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again. Huh. How about another banker bailout? <laughs> they just keep up, keep printing up money and they're not going to pay it. And we can't pay it. There's no way we could ever pay the, the trillions and trillions that our nation is in debt right now. You know, it's not going to happen. Verse 30. Look at that quick. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom and his tongue talketh of judgment. Oh, let's be positive. Let's not be judgmental. That's what the majority of professing Christians are saying today, but it says here that the righteous talk of judgment. Boy, God's going to pour out his wrath on this country. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to, I don't want to talk about that. The righteous talketh of judgment. They're not telling jokes. Something to think about. Okay, verse 36. Look at that quick. Uh, yet he passed away, and though he was not, yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. Talking about the wicked. All these wicked people out there, all the sodomites and everything that are making the laws, and all the wicked people, the senators and things like that, and there are still some good people in the government. I'm not down in government, okay? But all these wicked people that have all these ideas and things to destroy the earth, their time's coming. Don't worry about that. And remember, back there, when we started out this study, God said to Abraham and Sarah, this is going to come to pass. And they laughed about it. And there are a lot of people, God says, hey, the book of Revelation is going to come to pass. And they're laughing about it right now. Oh, come on. That can't happen. That's not going to happen. The Bible's full of contradictions. There's no perfect Bible, blah, blah, blah. It's going to come to pass. Don't worry about that. Okay, Psalm 52. Two more places to look up and then we're done. Psalm 52. 
verse 1. It says here, Why boastest, boastest thyself in mischief, O mighty man? The goodness of God endureth continually. Thy tongue de deviseth mischiefs like a sharp razor, working deceitfully. Thou lovest evil more than good, and lying rather than to speak righteousness, Selah. Thou lovest all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living, Selah. The righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at him. God is laughing at the wicked, but guess what? We also get to laugh at the wicked when we see their judgment. Lo, this is the man that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. So, not only is God going to be laughing, but we'll be laughing too. Proverbs chapter 1. This is where we'll end it. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 24 through 33. Okay, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 24. Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. There's your advice for today. Are there some bad times coming to America? Yes. What should you do about it? Hearken unto me. Hearken unto the Lord. You'll be, you will dwell safely, and you will be quiet from fear of evil. If you fear God, you aren't going to fear what man can do to you. Okay, your strength is to be in the Lord. Not in, in your self or the people in your community or whatever. Okay? Uh, so what can you do? What should you do? What, as a Christian, what should you do? First of all, you should humble yourself. Don't ever get too big. Don't ever get too proud. Stay humble before the Lord. Secondly, act sober. You, you know, laugh. It's good to laugh. But don't get to a point where you start acting like a fool. Okay, I've seen that. I've seen that among older people where they start just acting goofy and weird. I lose respect for them. You know, there's there's a brother I know. It's on YouTube, and just just a great man of God. But every once in a while, he puts out this video and he just acts like a fool, and I lose respect for the guy. I mean, he just he acts like a kid, like an adolescent. It just no, shouldn't be that way as a Christian. Okay, number three, pray for God's mercy and forgiveness. Realize that God's wrath right now is upon this country. And we need to pray for His mercy. Okay, number four, get busy for the Lord. Okay, one of the best things that you can do is pass out tracts. Witness to people. Get busy for the Lord. Number five, and this one I do just about every day, <laughs> pray for the rapture. I really do. More and more, I'm just like, that. I mean, that's the solution. That's the solution to all of our problems. You know? I mean, to think about it. In an instant, you will be glorified. No more temptation to sin. No more messing up. You'll have the mind of Christ. You know? Perfect. You know, I, I, I pray for that. You know, so that's my advice for the thing of laughter. Certainly, you know, you can laugh. You can have a good time, whatever. But just be careful that you don't get into foolish talking and jesting because that is listed as a sin. So anybody have any thoughts or comments or other things to turn to? Talking about uh, because of the hardness of 
from the hearts of people getting harder, including Christians. Is mm -hmm. I noticed when my wife died, when she was dying, uh, her children now, she was my second wife, and she was a widow, but I was divorced. Uh, her children, I mean, I had, I had a literally on her deathbed. I mean, you know how they all gathered, you know, not the, well, the time she died, but even the days before. I mean, just no somberness. It's just like they're, hey, how you doing, you know? And uh, I've seen at funerals, too, the people are getting less and less somber at viewings and funerals. They're just having a ball talking to each other and joking. Hmm. And even yeah. uh, my Joe Wanger friends, the, the one lady was on her deathbed. They had her down in the home there at the produce stand. And I brought her daughter-in-law down with the kids, and uh, I got complaints from her brother that, you know, the lady was in there dying, you know, and the kids were running around. I said, yeah, Amos, I said, I oh, know. They were trying to get her to talk to me, and I was thinking, you don't have to do that. This poor lady's laying there dying, you know. And so I've... I've seen it. When I was a kid, remember when my mom's sister died and we were going to the funeral? I ran to the car and Dad gave me a heck. He said, we're going to a funeral, don't run. You know? So it's like... Uh, that's that's a good point. Yeah. It really just, is. Just, hmm. And I'm... You, hey, you stepped on my toes this morning. I kind of get to be a little joke, joke too much sometimes. I do it myself. Yeah. The word joker came up to me don't be don't become a joker like that mm -hmm. you know some guys oh i'm a joker yeah, yeah you got to be careful of that yeah. i know i was i was you know with family last night and i started catching myself doing it i was just like oh, stop that's enough you know mm -hmm. one of those passages so. anybody else have anything else Okay, I guess that's it for this morning. Thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.